and welcome to this edition of DevOps Dialogues, Insights and Innovation. My name is Paul Nashwadi. I am the practice lead for the app dev practice at the Futurum Group. And today I am joined by Senior Director of Market Insights, hybrid platform at Red Hat, Stuart Miniman, for a discussion on Red Hat AI and virtualization impacts on DevOps. Stu, how are you? I'm doing great, Paul. Nice to chat with you. Yeah, great. It's good to have you on the session on the program today. We've, uh, we've done a number of sessions in the past. It's great to have you on this one as well. But, you know, when we look at everything that's been going on, Red Hat Summit just happened a little bit ago. Uh, lots of excitement, lots of uh, activity going on. Why don't we start there and talk a little bit about Red Hat Summit? Sure. Uh, th thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, it's hard to believe Red Hat Summit, uh, about a month behind us already. Uh, so in AI uh, time, that means everything has changed uh, <laughs> since then, right? Um, and Paul, for, for us, um, you, you think you go back a year ago and where we were with the overall discussion of uh, AI, we were, you know, six months into the kind of post chat GBT uh, discussion. So we've been talking about hybrid cloud for over a decade. AI has been one of those workloads that runs on Linux, runs on containers and Kubernetes that we've been talking about for years and years. Uh, but really Red Hat Summit was a way for us to kind of fill out our, our portfolio uh, when it comes to an AI standpoint, as well as really put a stake in the ground as to how we should think about open source in the AI world. Um, gotten feedback from many of the analysts like yourself and be like, hey, um, I'd expect Red Hat to be a little bit more uh, vocal on this stuff. And hopefully, uh, you know, the feedback in general we've got is uh, we have a strong voice. Obviously, we're doing a partnership with IBM Research and the like, working with all of our customers, the ecosystem out there. Um, and that's what Red Hat does. It's open source. Uh, we help build a community. We help foster uh, the collaboration and you know discussion of where we should be taking uh, this as an industry. Absolutely, Stu. And you know when I think about um, everything that you talked about and everything I learned when I was in in Denver there and and talking about you know with yourselves and the and the product teams <clears throat> at Red Hat, it's you know I look at our research and I see where is the market going, right? What's happening, right? So about nine months ago. I ran a survey um, that asked about running AI and production workloads, and we found about 18% of respondents said that they're running AI and production workloads. Then I re-ran that survey recently, uh, within the last month or so, and found that that number jumped to 54%. So when we look at that and we look at the adoption of what's happening with AI and production workloads and AI and as, a, as an accelerator for, for businesses, it really is uh, clearly an area where uh, organizations are taking a lot of vested interest in. And it's also very nice to see that uh, vendors are in alignment to where organizations are going. So when I look at the impacts to AI and the virtualization on the market, there's a lot of changes that are happening, right? There are a lot of changes across virtualization. There's a lot of changes across licensing models and, and deployments. When I talk to CIOs, their number one challenge and concern is to do application modernization, right? They're trying to grow and build their new, their next generation to, to where they're going, but they want to work with a partner that's going to be there. And you mentioned the ecosystem too. So let's talk a little bit about that. Like there's, there's this growth, there's a desire to modernize, there's skill gap issues, there's AI, there's tool stack and all this thing, but there's also an ecosystem. So what, what are your thoughts around and what's Red Hat's position around that? Yeah, uh, so obviously a pretty big topic uh, that you're talking about, Paul. Uh, let me start uh, with you know some of our customers and what they're really doing out there. So I had the opportunity to host a couple of panels uh, with some of our customers, and one of them uh, specifically talked about ecosystems. So one of our partners is AI Sweden, which is a really interesting kind of government-funded collaborative uh, in the Nordics. So they have a platform and they allow... Uh, different groups from all sorts of industries in, in Sweden and, and the surrounding companies to participate and leverage uh, the AI tooling. So they started years ago on this. So before generative AI, but absolutely they're diving in with generative AI. Um, and that platform, they've been using OpenShift. They adopted OpenShift AI. They were really interested in some of the announcements that we made at the conference, including uh, Instruct Lab and uh, how they would be able to contribute to it. And they've got everything from agriculture uh, to education, uh, to, uh, you know, startups working on autonomous vehicles and actually doing collaboration between them. And what was interesting about this panel is they are a partner of ours 
And we had a number of the other ecosystem partners uh, on stage talking with them. So from the model side, uh, Stability AI, a startup was there. And from the infrastructure side, you had Intel with their Gaudi 2 and Gaudi 3 chips, as well as Dell uh, with, with the hardware uh, to be able to provide uh, th that platform and kind of showed the full end to end from, you know, the, the hardware all the way through uh, the, the models to, you know, here is a, a collaborative uh, that is allowing uh, people to get their hands on and use uh, these environments. And AI Sweden was a great one. Uh, I had another panel uh, in a, one of the AI breakfasts that we did uh, with a, a JASIC, which is a company company down in Uruguay, and they also have a government-funded collaborative where you get research, public, and private sector all coming together. And in that case, it's some of the Latin American companies coming together. So, you know, I was super excited to see just the kind of these hotbeds of innovation where they're lowering the bar to entry, allowing, you know, small small companies uh, and, you know, some government agencies that you might not think of taking advantage of AI getting access to that and being able to accelerate their journey going forward. Yeah, Stu, you know, what I liked about what you were just talking when you were kind of talking is you're talking about these case studies, you're talking about the ecosystem, and it wasn't just the big, huge conglomerates that are out there. It's the emerging companies too. And working with the emerging companies and kind of bringing it all together, uh, it really helps with innovation, right? It helps with kind of the, like filling those gaps where organizations are challenged with, you know, some of those some of those things that we talked about, the the, the, the complexity issues, the the skill gap issues. Um, what about what about service delivery partners. Do you have anything to kind of add around that? I know that obviously Red Hat has a, a large partner ecosystem, but the service delivery partners, usually I advise organizations when they say, oh, you have skill gap issues. We can't, we can't move forward. I advise to work with service delivery partners. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so so it's interesting, Paul. Like one of the big announcements that we made at the show was in Struck Lab, which is how can I actually contribute uh, and participate? And over half of the people that attended Red Hat Summit actually got hands on with it. Did a quick like you know fifteen minutes. How do I do it? So on the one hand, we want to lower the bar to entry so much that. You know, if I have, you know, a decent laptop with a GPU in it, I can actually get my hands on it. Um, I know you saw REL AI is uh, one, one of the new offerings that we have. And that's just basically a REL operating environment that includes uh, the, the Granite models in it. So from a delivery standpoint, we want to be able to bring as many people in that might not have the skill set and lower that bar to entry. Um, but you, you're absolutely right. We had a huge focus at the show about how do we do enablement. So uh, AI, it's still a little bit emerging as to you know who has the skill sets and who can drive us along. Uh, one of the places we're having a large discussion with our service uh, delivery partners is around the virtualization opportunities. So you mentioned it kind of in, in the warm up here. Um, everybody wants to do AI. It's something that they might not have new budget or new headcount, but they're you know, one of the top priorities from the C-suite is make sure you can take advantage of AI because if you don't, our competition will, and there are those opportunities. Um, but from a virtualization standpoint, there's a large percentage of our customer base that are having to reevaluate what they're doing based on some of the things that have happened recently in the industry. And the channel partners, the GSIs, uh, consulting partners absolutely are fully engaged on that opportunity. And part of it, I don't like to look at those as two separate things, Paul. It's many of the things that you were doing and you're saying, hey, if I thought my job was being a virtualization admin, I've probably been looking at what the future of that was going to be anyway, and taking advantage of automation, taking advantage of learning new skills like AI is something that many in that space have been looking at for a whole number of years. You and I have a lot of background in that community and have heard that 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 message for the last you know at least five years, Paul. Uh, so that's where I would say you know today the huge service opportunity is things like migration aren't simple, and I need skills, hands, uh, and, you know, places where I can actually engage with the customers and we need bodies to be able to help with that. Yeah. And no, you know, I, I want to touch on a couple of things you mentioned. One, I, uh, I, I, I got into the instruct lab and I did actually was on fingers on keyboard. So I actually did it, which was kind of cool. Nice. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Wait, wait, wait. Analyst, you're allowed to touch that stuff, Paul. I, I thought we'd just talk about it. I flipped know, so. my badge around and I went in. I, I, I grabbed, didn't I grab your badge? And I went, anyways, we, we kind of went in and it did it. But yeah, it was incognito. Uh, but it was fun. It was fun to kind of go in and see hands-on like what, 
what the user experience looks like and how do you reduce complexity. And, and it's important because, you know, what we see in our research is 67% of, of uh, organizations are actually looking to hire generalists over specialists. So when I, that was one of the reasons why I kind of went in and I said, well, okay, I, I will consider myself a generalist. I'm technical by nature. And I kind of can go in and see if I can figure some stuff out. And, and, and I really could. It was always really like it was there. It was kind of ease of use. Now, granted, I think that, you know, I think my, my skill is kind of far below what a lot of these organizations are when it comes to developers. But it was, it was definitely interesting to see um, how they would, how, you know, how you were doing the, the deployments and reducing the complexity. Um, you know, with that said, I also think... Uh, of, you know, you mentioned you need the hands, right? And you need the kind of the bodies to kind of put up the, at the, at the projects. And, and, you know, when I think of that and I think of uh, organizations where they're going and, and when I, I think of Stonehenge, right. And I think of, um, you know, these big, huge rocks, right. And they somehow, some, I have no idea how, but somehow those rocks were put up on top of other rocks, right. They were pushed up there. And I'm thinking if you put as many hands as you can underneath one of those rocks, I still bet that you couldn't lift that rock. When I think about where we are in AI and application development and, and such, I think about that example. Um, the more hands you throw at projects, yeah, that's important, but it's also equally important to look at the tool and the tech stack in order to achieve your goals. We're seeing that applications are being developed far more rapidly, more applications being developed, uh, you know, than, than just a few years ago. So the more hands you throw at is going to kind of be uh, a one approach. Another approach is to use automation. And, you know, when we look at Lightspeed and how Lightspeed helps with uh, some of those announcements, like with Lightspeed into OpenShift and, you know, like it was it was part of Ansible and the automation piece there. Can you talk a little bit about that announcement? Yep, uh, absolutely. So, right. If, if we look at AI, uh, there's a couple of things that, you know, everyone's doing. Number one is, you know, where are we with models, uh, so some of the deliverables uh, to help customers use AI? And then the, the the second piece is how is every product being infused with AI? So I don't know about you, Paul, but every time I do an update on my phone, uh, I feel like uh, the app is like, hey, I've got this new AI thing that's going to help me along and do that. Um, and some of them are useful. Uh, some of them have a lot of hallucinations and are a little bit weird. Um, but it's a journey we've we've actually been on for a while. So you mentioned we started uh, with what is now called Ansible Lightspeed. Uh, it was originally called Project Wisdom. So we were working closely with IBM Research on that. And it was how do we help you know, get greater productivity out of our people? And from an Ansible standpoint, it was let's help generate playbooks through you know, natural language. Let me type something in and generate a playbook. Um, and it, it really has gotten to the point now it can almost automate that in full process for me. Um, from an OpenShift standpoint, it's a little bit different. So when we looked at this and said, OK, how do we infuse AI into what we're doing? Really what it is is a chatbot. Um, and so something that would be in our 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 portal uh, when you go in and I should be able to ask it questions and there's general knowledge there, but I should actually be able to have a trained model based on my environment. So the case study that we showed um, in the keynote was, uh, uh, it, it was an insurance company and I should be able to, uh, you know, build some things and, you know, the, 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 the light speed piece uh, can, can help accelerate what I'm doing with OpenShift. You know, for example, if I, you know, need to worry about scaling, it can give me a couple of options there, point me to the right tools and, and help me take advantage uh, of proper operators that I'm doing. So absolutely something we're rolling out. Uh, the OpenShift light speed uh, is, is something that uh, I believe we call it, it's like an alpha at this point. So customers can get it. We really want their feedback and something over time that will be baked into the product. Because what's nice is these light speed products the, the, these light speeds really, are, I should say, are features. They are not something that we're necessarily looking to upcharge in the market, which I, I'm sure something you look at is something we all look at is, okay, wait, is this something that's just going to make my overall experience and make my product stickier? Or is it something that we're looking to increase the price? Um, and, you know, per seat, I'm going to charge an extra, you know, bit for whatever that extra piece is. So that's where we have products like OpenShift AI and now RHEL AI uh, that, that are products. And then we have uh, the, the pieces that are going to enhance our offerings from the Lightspeed, which are just part of the overall portfolio itself. 
No, there's definitely a lot there to unpack. There's definitely a lot to talk about, um, you know, and unfortunately we don't have a whole lot more time, but if somebody were to get started, you know, this is a DevOps uh, kind of series, people with the DevOps, one of the audience that, that views these sessions are trying to like understand these different tech stacks and what they're doing. How would they get started? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> of course the, the biggest thing is kind of where are you in your journey and which products are you using? Um, the, the one that I'd recommend, you know, I, I thought was one of the coolest things we talked about was Instruct Lab. So the great thing about Instruct Lab, it's up on GitHub. It's also up on Hugging Face. Uh, I actually had a team meeting down uh, at our headquarters in Raleigh and our whole team spent a few hours, you know, Paul, I got my hands on it, you know, download it on my laptop. It did some work. Um, it does some synthetic generation. So I created like five or six queries in it, added a messaging doc on top of it. It was all done in YAML. And then it generated like a hundred other things to help train that model. So it's something that everybody, you know, a developer can be like, hey, I want to understand what this does and have everything. I can actually go play with it. So, you know, usually if you want to get, get in the code, Instruct Lab's a great place to do it. Um, if you are an Ansible or an OpenShift customer, you can go look at those light speed pieces. Um, and of course, from Red Hat, you're going to expect what we're doing. It's all open source. So um, I'd love also the feedback from the community because lots of questions as to what gets open source, what about my data, what am I going to contribute? Um, we think that we, we know that today, like open source is the default development model for software. And we want to have a robust discussion with the community as to how that fits into the entire AI world. And it's not just what we're doing with like the granite models. You've got Mistral and Llama and others out there that can work with these toolings. And we're working closely with our customers on that uh, in, in the open source space, as well as, of course, our, our cloud providers who have uh, some more proprietary models that lots of customers are also playing with. Stu, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Always a pleasure to talk to you. It's uh, very insightful. Thanks for your perspective and insights. The show was great. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, I agree with you. Instruct Lab is a fun place to kind of get started, but it also is has a real solid practicality to it as well, which is which is awesome. Uh, but all the other announcements, there's so much to talk about. Um, you can for, for the audience. I want to thank you for your participation and 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 watching our session today. But also, you can learn more about our coverage. Uh, of, of Red Hat Summit at, um, at thefuturumgroup.com. We have a full research note that's highlighting all the details and, and of the announcements, as well as it ties back to our research study. So it's, we can show that the what Red Hat's doing and what the market insights are doing kind of in a, are in alignment. So it's a, it's a good, it's a good kind of uh, summary of the event. And so I want to thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you for having me on, Paul. Thank you.